Hello and welcome to this first episode of the podcast. I have the pleasure of having Kristen Jensen with me. Kristen and I go back a long way. Uh, Kristen was one of the people who interviewed me uh, when I applied for my first job in Denmark, which was the graduate program in Novo Nordisk way back in 2009. Um, and then I was lucky when Kristen called me one day to ask me if I wanted to be part of his team on a very interesting journey. I said yes. and and that period was was a period of immense learning and growth for me personally uh, and i got to learn a great deal from christian about leadership about deliveries to the c suit and the board when when they are having all the focus on you uh, and also about just working with people um, and needless to say christian has had a huge impact and influence on the way i think about leadership and working in general so it's a pleasure to have you with me christian here on this first episode thank you for joining Thank, thank you so much, Ranjit. Actually, when you mention, uh, I don't know, in, in my career, uh, I'm not that old, but actually, I think I've been taking part of, of maybe hiring more than, yeah, more than 100 people, right? But uh, what I think still, uh, I, I, I clearly recall the uh, the interview and the whole process around around you, uh, around you starting in all notice. So, uh, so thanks for saying the nice words about me leaving an impact. I can uh, I can uh, throw it right back at you. You definitely made an impact when we uh, when we first met, and also, of course also when we worked together. I but thanks for having. Me. Pleasure. Thanks for having. So, if we can, uh, let's start with with slow and easy with your current role. If you can describe what do you do, what you're responsible for. Yeah, yeah. I'm. Uh, I mean, uh, you left Novo Nordisk some years uh, back. I'm. Uh, I'm still in the company and very, very happy about my role. Uh, today, I'm heading up what we call the digital incubator and innovation, and uh, I'm responsible for for part of the digital journey in in Novo Nordisk. So, we have uh, we have various various initiatives in uh, in 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 my area. I'm uh, I'm under the wings of what we call global IT. So I report to our CIO Anas Romar. Uh, we have in my area, we are doing uh, digital health. So we built the uh, front end applications that patients, doctors are using for, for managing uh, diabetes. Uh, we, uh, we have a lot of uh, backbone infrastructure that, uh, that we use for uh, uh, exchanging data with partner companies in, in this ecosystem of, of making sure that our patients receive really nice outcomes on uh, using our our pharma products together with digital solutions. Then we do a lot of software development. Uh, we do a lot of, uh, of uh, you could say, a lot of projects where we are basically optimizing our value chain uh, using software. Uh, so it's end-to-end cloud-native developed uh, software where, we, uh, where we're really doing some, uh, some really interesting things that could be stuff in research, development, uh, production, commercial, uh, all over the place. That's really cool. Then we have, um, we're doing innovative stuff in a business garage where we play around with emerging technologies, trying to, to, uh, to find new revenue streams, uh, do, uh, do crazy things that, uh, that can disrupt either the company or, or maybe even some parts of the industry. So that's, uh, that's also really, really interesting. So we are, we're quite busy. We're quite busy. Uh, very happy about my role. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's sort of the frontier of, of what is happening in pharma. So uh, I'm very excited. Fantastic. Sounds like really exciting stuff uh, at the forefront of innovation, basically. Um, this podcast is about leadership in general. Right? Um, so if we can kind of go back, go down memory lane um, and, and talk about your first leadership position, what was it? Uh, what were you responsible for the team and, and what was the experience like? Yeah, Be, uh, before joining Novo Nordisk, I had a few uh, I had a few stints in, in other companies. Um, at that point in time, I was uh, I was not a leader. Uh, I was working as a consultant. Uh, joining Novo Nordisk, I, I started in a role where I supported a management team doing a lot of administrative, strategic stuff. Not being a leader, but then uh, then I, I I kind of uh, gained my interest in uh, in leadership um, at that time. Basically, to be honest, I, I, I've, I probably had the feeling that I felt a bit overtaken uh, by a lot of people when, when, when I was measuring myself head to head on being a specialist. At that time, I did a lot of financials, SAP, in-house banking. But honestly, I never really felt that I was the best one. And that has probably a little bit to do with the interest. I, I kind of 
went down on interest on on the very technical stuff um, and then i gained more uh, again I, then i gained more appetite on uh, on leadership uh, from from working with uh, with my boss who hired me into into Novo Nordisk. and uh, <laughs> like you uh, like you nicely mentioned that that i left a footprint with you uh, in leadership i really had some really really strong mentors or some strong uh, role models around me that that probably sparked that fire of, uh, of going into leadership. And my first role was basically to manage an SAP department mm-hmm. in, uh, in Novo Nordisk, um, for real, uh, being, being a, you could say, a real manager slash leader. Um, and and that, was, uh, that, was, that was a very nice experience. Um, a, a bit scary, I would say. I think the first, the first step into leadership is probably all, always the most, the most scary, right? <laughs> yeah. And, and what was the scary part? Is it because you're then you're responsible for people, people report to you, and you know you're responsible for the yeah. I think that, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. I think what was scary. I I knew uh, I knew about the functional domain. I knew about mm-hmm. SAP. I knew about reporting. I knew about the financials, etc. But I think the the scary part is that you. Uh, you are sort of mandated with a certain responsibility, and uh, you you have a budget. You you are responsible for uh, for ensuring performance. You are responsible for a department reaching targets. You are responsible for resource allocations across maybe a project portfolio or something. So, and 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 then then of course you have a huge responsibility in terms of ensuring that systems applications processes are running so that uh, that the business can function right so uh, so that i actually found to be honest a little bit a little bit scary um mm-hmm. in a way i think at that time i was uh, i was more obsessed with being a manager than than maybe a leader at that time uh, i was very focused on you know ensuring the dates the capacity the budgets uh, you know all the kind of like easy to do <laughs> I don't know if it's easy, but that was more sort of portfolio management rather than you know true leadership. Um, but but I think that's that's maybe where most people start when you go into leadership. That is trying to control the, you could say the to dos, the boundaries, the the budgets, the all the uh, all the limitations and whatnot. Uh, and and then maybe when you gain more experience, maybe you are. Maybe you get the opportunity to sort of climb the ladder. Then you go more into into uh, having a more strategic outlook you go into more sort of uh, what i would call maybe true leadership mm-hmm. more than more than the the managerial aspects sure one thing i want to ask you around so you said uh, i think in a lot of your leadership uh, kind of positions you said you've you've been leading a lot of specialists right so you, like you said mm-hmm. your first position was leading a team of sap specialists and i'm sure mm-hmm. that's been the case further on so when it comes to leading specialists or people with you know very very thorough knowledge on a very specific domain, mm. uh, what are your thoughts on leading them? You know, mm. so if someone has to start, if someone is going to lead a team of specialists as the first leadership position, mm. what are the mm. one or two things you would advise them to, uh, to keep in mind when leading a team of specialists? Yeah, I think it, it's in, in so many aspects, it's really important that the manager is not sort of trying to, to interfere with the domains or, you know, make uh, himself, herself wiser on, this, on, the, on the knowledge that the specialists have. I mean, I think in a way to gain respect in, in, a, in, in such a setting where you have a, maybe a large group of very specialized people, it is kind of like to orchestrate the work so they get the job done, but but sort of not necessarily trying to, uh, to you know to try to solve their work. I mean that that is really what they are hired for, right? It, that is to apply the specialist knowledge. So it's it's like uh, maybe running the ceremony, but not being part of <laughs> of, uh, of of kind of playing the music, right? Mm-hmm. Then I actually think in so many aspects, it's uh, it's actually nice not to uh, to be at a level where you understand everything that goes on uh, under the hood, so to speak, because that that allows you to to ask a lot of questions, and and maybe challenge uh, challenge decisions or challenge a way forward or challenge a certain tactics or something. 
because you are kind of it's legitimate to to ask the questions because I mean how should I know? So uh, so I think that's actually helped me a lot uh, in, in my leadership style. Is also uh, maybe we'll also get back to that, but it's really to empower the people. I have a lot of trust in people. Um, I always start to to allow people, you know, full trust, and then then, then they can take it down themselves. But uh, my default is basically to to start uh, trusting people. Uh, and and you know, if if I trust that the specialists are doing their work uh, correctly, and we meet deadlines and timelines and whatnot, then uh, then then I'm happy. Then 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 why why should I interfere with uh, with all the bits and pieces? Yeah, really really interesting advice. Uh, so if you we talked about your first leadership position. So if you could walk us through the journey from there to where you are now, and also mm. uh, maybe ref, uh, touch upon some of the, the inflection points or some of the turning points, mm. which you think yeah. uh, took you to where you are now. You know, a lot yeah. of people say, some people say, you know, I, I just did my current job well and it took me to where it is. Uh, mm. Was that the case with you or did you have to actually plan or make some decisions on the way? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, it's a it's a it's a big it's a big uh, question. I think in a way, a, a good piece of advice is always to do your current job really well, uh, or at least try to. Uh, that then then you probably get, or then there's probably a higher likelihood that you get other opportunities in uh, in your career. For myself, I've never been the type of person that had tried to uh, to make like a, a five year plan for what should happen. Uh, honestly, I've always struggled when when people ask me to do, you know, what is your long term uh, aspiration or your long term career uh, plan? You know, I've, I've always um, kind of thrived when 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 somebody saw that I could fit into something uh, that has been very motivating for me. That someone said, you know, if we have a challenge, or we have problems or something. Could we could we maybe call Christian and see if he can, uh, you know, take part of uh, of solving it? Stuff like that. Is, is extremely motivating for me. So the domain itself is not necessarily what, what drives me. Um, maybe I've been, been, been lucky always to be in very exciting domains, but, but the, the, um, you could say the specialist knowledge of the domain as such is not necessarily what, what is the most important to me. It's more that the, the, there should be some challenges, there should be something where I, where I feel that I make a difference. And in in the, in my in the early stages of my career, I think you you get opportunities and you are rotated a little bit. Uh, one one inflection point was uh, me going from from being part of uh, you could say the financial or the SAP community to to start uh, working with infrastructure and security. Uh, at that time, honestly, I didn't know much about it, but I was super interested in the domain. And then I just, you know, read a lot, tried to uh, try to up myself, uh, and and then I was asked to head up a small uh, small department uh, within the security space, and and that was around the time where where you and I we uh, we met up. And that that was uh, extremely motivating, and there was a lot of lot of challenges. The I think it's fair to say that the company was somewhat lagging behind uh, on on implementing uh, the right measures for, for keeping the organization uh, at an at a acceptable uh, uh, security posture. Uh, so we had a lot of really, really interesting projects, investments, uh, challenges, uh, emergency responses or critical incidents or whatever. So that was very, very, uh, very nice times for me. Tough, but nice. And then you would say later in my career, I. I, after after being in, in security for for some years in infrastructure, I I moved on to uh, to head up um, our our IT function out of Bangalore. So that that again was something where I uh, you know not something that I was actively pursuing as such, but I was very open to to uh, to living uh, outside of Denmark and try some uh, you know get some different experiences with my uh, with my family. That was then. Then I was asked if if I could uh, if I could go there, uh, hit up uh, what we call global IT uh, India, and I immediately accepted. I of course I, I had a, a very very short dialogue with my wife. That was like a three minute dialogue, and, and we, you know, we hugged each other and said yes, we'll do it. And we uh, we went just a few months later. We uh, we had our house in India. And I spent spent four years in India uh, in in two different roles. <laughs> Uh, one role heading up global IT, and, and uh, the latter role was to to head up our our uh, service center, or what was at that time called uh, our our service center in uh, out of Bangalore. Uh, I think 
you could say that is an inflection point itself that you kind of move out of your safe haven you move from from your safe space in in, in denmark to uh, to a to a big city like bangalore in, in south india that was uh, that was extremely uh, inspiring for yeah not only for me but for my but for my family as well mm-hmm. yeah two things i want to pick up on um from your answer uh, one is when we work together um, in the security compliance space uh, mm-hmm. one of the areas where i learned the most was you know during times of crisis and there were something mm-hmm. really bad happening all the focus mm-hmm. is on you and the team uh, you mm-hmm. know you have to deliver um, and there are a lot of things right you know fixing the problem make sure there's mm-hmm. for the damage finding mm-hmm. the root cause yeah. keeping all the people on top uh mm. costly communicated so if you can talk us through what what goes in your mind when when a situation like that happens you know how do you deal with yeah. crisis situations yeah 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 but i've i've been in i've been in a few situations like that in uh, in my sort of professional life and you know that for me there's a big difference between being being you know being very busy on something or then moving into what i would call a crisis situation um I guess we all recognize, you know, being at times being busy or even being too busy where where you're sort of completely pulled in into work. And and honestly, sometimes when I'm very busy, I don't find that I'm necessarily um, very effective when when working. You know, I don't get I'm not very effective at 11:30 in the evening if I'm, you know, just busy doing strategies or mm-hmm. year end closing or preparing for meetings or whatever. But when you are in a in a state of 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 crisis or something where you have to catch up and take a lot of decisions fast then in a way your your teams will will naturally rally behind that um, and they will sort of give you much more than what you have i think my own capacity uh, is is going up by uh, i don't know times two or three when uh, when i'm in a state of of crisis and that that i think is really interesting and that's also a, a situation where you can maybe display more of your sort of true leadership style i mean uh, here here i'm really talking about uh, making sure that the team is uh, is empowered and that, mm-hmm. that everyone can can thrive and that you keep an eye on people who might need that extra pat on the back or or some kind of arrangement to make them uh, effective right uh, and and you know you also recall ranger that that when you are in, in this state of of uh, of working you you put in a lot of hours so that of course have some some consequences on your you know forget about work life balance right <laughs> it, but it has some consequences you you have to go home and tell your your spouse your how uh, your your kids and whatever that uh, for the next month or so uh, mom they are very very busy so uh, so rest assured that I'll be back but uh, but for now uh, don't count on me right that's that's actually an important dialogue to uh, to have with your mm. with your relative with your spouse i think but for me i just i know myself well enough to know that that under such a pressure i'm actually good i'm actually comfortable i get i get the, i get energy i get somewhat yeah. excited and i want to i want to prove that that you know my team and myself we can we can pull it through we just need the uh, we just need a few a uh, few extra pizza nights and uh, and some sleeping bags then uh, then just hit us right <laughs> fascinating and you know stuff like that you don't learn on, on an online course or an mba right i mean you can learn the theoretical part but actually being there facing it and dealing with it i think that's where the real learning is so that was fortunate to be part of those learning experiences with you one thing i i really want to dive on on uh, was on your indian experience yeah. uh, so as 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 a day probably not having lived or worked in india before and mm. and taking the jump uh to decide to move your family to india and and be there for four years uh mm-hmm. what was the experience like was there something that kind of really hit you hard something you didn't expect at all or was it kind of smooth mm-hmm. flowing from the beginning yeah i've actually i've had that question uh, a few times <laughs> many times uh, i'm sure i think it's uh, it's actually quite uh, i i really like the question so i think when 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 we had when we had those family discussions around uh, having a sort of like a family experience outside of denmark I was like, you know, if if I are, I'm actually from a personal point of view, I'm pretty I'm a pretty sort of safe playing guy. I could probably have lived my life happily without having those kind of experiences 
because that's sort of the, the easy way not to challenge yourself on that, right? On the other hand, there was something in me saying that, that you know, life is too short not to try to do something like that. And, you know, the, the, my, my, my kids, my two daughters at that time, they were at an age where it was actually doable. There's always, you know, what is a good time? But, but yeah. it was, we felt it was a good time. And then I really had the thought, you know, why not US? Why not try to go to, to Zurich in Switzerland or, or something else? And then I was like, if, if we are doing this, why, why don't we just maximum the, uh, the output of it and, and do something that, that very few would maybe do or dare? Uh, and, and, you know, we, we took a very conscious decision on that. If, if we are sort of doing it, then, then let's go all in. Let's get, uh, let's, get a, let's get a taste of everything. And then, then uh, this opportunity around India came up. And um, yeah, honestly, I, we, we enjoyed every single day. It, uh, and we, are, we also talk about it almost every day. We have some, now we've been in Denmark for, for the last uh, two years, but we, uh, we talk about our experience almost every day. What, what I think is people will maybe think that it's a big jump uh, managing uh, either, you know, how, how can you how can you start managing in an environment that is with that many uh, you can say cultural differences and, and you know and maybe a different style of working or interacting or whatever but honestly I found it maybe I'm a borderline naive here but but actually I didn't found that part very difficult I honestly don't think that culturally we are very far from each other I mean we are it was this it's the same company right so first of all you could say the company culture uh, our what we call Novo Nordisk way, that's the same regardless of, uh, of where you go. But I think I was positively surprised how, how easy it was actually to, to sort of tap into to, uh, the overall in, uh, culture in India. It's not that far from, uh, from honestly, from, uh, from, uh, from, from where I grew up here in Denmark. Uh, people are extremely welcoming. They, uh, they use a lot of humor. There's a lot of interest in you, and there's a lot of sort of openness to uh, to discuss things. Um, so you you feel very welcome, and when you feel welcome, you also start opening up. You, you start to share more of uh, of yourself, right? Mm. And I really found that uh, to be sort of my way through that. Simply just be myself, be very curious, and of course uh, respect the culture, respect, try to sort of blend in, try to learn as much as I could. And uh, you could say one thing is sort of the, the corporate life, but, but I really enjoyed spending time uh, in, you know, off hours uh, when, when I, you know, afternoon, evenings or, or weekends, just sort of uh, inhaling the, inhaling everything I could <laughs> in, the, in, in the city, right? Um, here, I don't mean all the dust and the fog and whatnot, but, you know, really, really getting close to the nature. Uh, I, I love taking uh, taking trips out in, in in the nature, you know, exploring what's outside of the city, uh, meeting uh, meeting local people, and you know, every everywhere you go, you uh, you meet a smile, and you you always feel safe. I mean, I had my two daughters; they um, I, I probably only a few times where I felt that the, that they were maybe not safe, and you know, that was basically their own fault, right? running around late hours uh, <laughs> with their friends or whatever, but. Uh, but you always feel safe uh, regardless of where you go. So culturally, it, it's a big difference. Of course, when you when you scroll through your your photo stream, you see a lot of things that are very far away from what you normally see in Denmark. But uh, uh, all basically all things that I miss now. Very interesting, because uh, I I wouldn't have imagined that being an answer. Because that you know, then it's very close as you experience. Uh, the, the kind of cultures uh, between Denmark and India. But I think that also yep. goes to, or like mm -hmm. you said, being open and being curious uh, and being inquisitive about, about people and, yeah. and who you are. I think that's yeah. a big part of it. Yeah, and, and basically, uh, I mean, it, it, uh, you, you have to be curious and you have to let go of, of things that you have uh, learned growing up. I mean, I, I come from a different uh, religion, you know, me being uh, grown up in Denmark with, uh, with Christianity, then, then, you, uh, then you go to a country with uh, basically a lot of different religions. Uh, of course, you have some big ones, but then you have a lot of, uh, lot of uh, sort of uh, Sub uh, variations <laughs> and stuff, yeah. right? So, so you have to be curious and you have to understand why, uh, why those religions are, uh, why they work so well in, in, in India. Um, 
So I think the, the key word here is curiosity and, and forget about uh, trying to apply biases and you know also leave home all your thoughts around that uh, where you grew up is the best place on earth, right? That's not really, <laughs> that's not really true. So um, yeah, I think it's about curiosity and embracing. Great. And now if, if look at in, looking at you know, the, the work part of it, did you have to change your, the way you lead in India? adjusting to the way people work there? Or was it more or less the same as you would have done in Denmark? I think naturally you, you, you of course there will be things that you kind of adjust, but when, uh, when I apply my leadership, I always feel more comfortable if I don't try to sort of stretch myself to play a certain role. If, if I'm comfortable being myself, and if that's good enough, then that's good enough. Then, then, then there's, uh, in a way, no, no need or no, uh, no reason to try to be someone else. So uh, I would say that I managed uh, my way through uh, being myself. Uh, and, and sometimes that's, that works really well. And sometimes it maybe not work that well. But then you kind of learn from that. Um, and I would say, in general, it works well to, uh, to show trust to people, give people trust. And, and maybe the normal, I would say the normal Novo Nordisk way of managing uh, with, with showing a lot of respect for the individual and having a lot of trust, maybe that is not necessarily the default across all companies in India that we uh, compare to. I think in, 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 uh, in India, there are many companies that are much more hierarchical uh, in, in their setup uh, where you uh, where you sort of maybe the the newcomers maybe are not allowed to talk to the CEO or whatever but but I think in in Novo Nordisk the the difference for me was not uh, was not very big uh, whether I I, uh, I was managing or leading in, in Denmark or India uh, and I think that's of course something around the, the company culture but it's something that you you have to I mean we hired a lot of people in India so it's it's you don't build uh, a culture by uh, you know, overnight, it's something that you have to maintain, and you have to explain people what what the uh, what is this company about, what is the purpose of the company, how do we how do we run the company, what is Novo Nordisk way. But I mean, we invested a lot in, in that, and then I actually think we managed to have a, a very a very healthy organization where people felt comfortable uh, sharing ideas, uh, not sort of removing the the very the very you could say the usual hierarchies that. That people probably met in some of the other companies they worked for before joining Novo Nordisk. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I kind of learned, or that was probably one of the learnings that that these things doesn't happen by itself. It's something that you have to invest a lot of time in. Uh, and and honestly, I, uh, I I took personal pride in running the uh, the on, part of the onboarding program myself. I wanted to meet everyone that joined the organization. And, and here we are talking a lot of people, right? So. So now the organization is close to 3,000 people uh, and, and growing. So, so, uh, so spending time meeting everyone, having the onboarding sessions around uh, Novo Nordisk Way, for example, that that kind of that that gave me a lot of energy to uh, sort of sort of explain explain that. And I also felt that people, if they hadn't heard about it before joining, then at least they had they had a good compass for uh, for for how to uh, how to uh, sort of. Uh, yeah, behave, work in, in, in Northern Irish. I think the really critical point you made about the role culture plays, um, right? Especially something like the Northern Irish way, where it's not just something on paper where people actually walk the talk. I think that mm. plays a huge role in making sure no matter which part of the world you're in, it kind of is it's a similar culture, although mm. allowing for differences in local geographies, it's still the same overall company culture that people follow. I think that makes it easier for people to work and collaborate across. Yeah, yeah, and you would say it's of course it's naive to think that you. I mean, you should never try to change a culture. You have to accept that mm -hmm. that we are a company that operate in uh, in in close to two hundred different cultures, more or less, right? So, so we can we can keep some principles, we can keep some values, and we can we can apply those in in a in a you could say local culture in a local setting. And at least from, from my experience uh, in, uh, in, in India, that, that actually went very well hand in hand. So before uh, moving away from India, any, anything 
that kind of really etched in your memory, like any experience or incidents from India that kind of really sticks to you still? I'm sure there's many, but if you have to choose yeah, one. There were, there were a lot of, uh, I, I will be honest, I think there were also a lot of things that were, that were really, really tough. Um, I mean, uh, I had times where I felt quite lonely when you are, when you are the, the head of a function or, or head of a unit. I mean, in, in, uh, in my normal setting here in Denmark, I mean, there's always kind of like a, a shoulder to lean on, or you have, you have a lot of, uh, a lot of peers or, or, uh, or I mean, you, you meet also, you meet a lot of different executives. I mean, just, just walk the, walk the halls. Right. But, mm -hmm. but in India, I had times where I felt a bit lonely because I felt that sometimes it was maybe a little bit difficult to share some of the struggles that, that, that I had, or, you know, if, if, if I had to take uh, decisions, uh, you know, tough decisions that impact people or, or something, then, then I, I didn't feel that I had sort of the, you know, uh, always a, a shoulder to lean on. Um, mm. Of course, I had some really, really good people uh, in, in my management team. Some uh, I, 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 I could lean on, but, but, you know, for some decisions, for some stuff, you are a little bit kind of on your own. And then, of course, you have a staff around you, but um, the, the tough decisions uh, sit with you. Uh, and, and honestly, I think uh, when, when you are uh, sort of based uh, uh, in, in, a, in a place like India, where you, that is not, that's not my home, it became my home in a way, but, uh, but, uh, but, but then you are a little bit uh, on, on, uh, on uh, you're not on your normal home turf. Uh, so I think I probably engaged my wife uh, or, or other friends or, or people back in Denmark in more of my dilemmas than, uh, than, than I would have done or, or at least what I do in my current role. Yeah. Now we're we are moving on to what I call the home run, um, mm -hmm. which we have questions, but I want to keep them consistent across uh, episodes. Uh, the first of which is if you look back at your career uh, or leadership mm -hmm. career so far, is there any particular challenge that, that you want to share? Uh, which was maybe one of the toughest or most interesting uh, for whatever reason, or the biggest challenge you faced. I think, uh, yeah, I think I, I have, I've had uh, difficult challenges. Uh, I've had, uh, I've had some, I've been gifted having some, uh, some really good uh, bosses uh, during my time that I've actually learned a lot from. I think one, I've had many challenges, so, so I could probably use one of your, uh, your podcasts on, on challenges. <laughs> only, do but, that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I hope everyone acknowledges that they have had challenges. Otherwise, I think people are probably a little bit naive. Uh, I think I've had a few times where I felt that I needed like a good a good rubbing from my boss, or where where I got maybe a good rubbing from my boss on uh, on uh, on you know changing uh, changing something. Either I haven't uh, uh, achieved the targets in the right manner, or, or Maybe uh, maybe done something that was not necessarily appreciated, uh, taking decisions that were off or whatever. In in a long career, obviously everyone will will face challenges like that. Back to back to what we discussed earlier. I actually thrive when when I get some challenges that that can be solved, and and uh, when you are not afraid of attracting challenges to yourself, then you also have some uh, mess ups from time to time or something where you uh, take a decision that later proves that maybe it was not the right decision or maybe you should have uh, done something differently. But in a way, I'm, I'm not too afraid of doing that because what lies deep in me is that I would like to get to decisions pretty fast. And when you, when you have that mindset, you also have to accept that, that, I mean, if you don't spend two years analyzing, if you rather spend two weeks and then taking a decision, then sometimes you also get wiser. And you, uh, you, you. But again, then, then you probably just, just uh, wasted less time, right? But, but that, that is probably one of the themes that, um, that I throughout my career have been struggling a little bit with. That I like to get to some decisions. I don't like uh, too much beating around the bush and not taking decisions because then, then I get, then I get fatigue and, and you know. Normally, I don't think necessarily you improve that much by by spending, uh, you know, double the time on on doing the analysis. Uh, but but honestly, that has hit me a few times where I, where I must acknowledge that that you know the the answer would have been different if we spent double the time or or something. Um, concrete decisions uh, or concrete 
uh, things. I mean, I've been through I've been through most, I think, with with my uh, experience. But I mean, when we worked together, we had really really, really tough decisions on uh, to do to take in, in security. <clears throat> I do remember uh, closing down our uh, part of our production in Kalundborg before, before because we took some some very brutal decisions in in a weekend um, where we basically had to scrap. Uh, um, products worth a double digit uh, millions but it was a decision that i felt was the right at the time and i was also willing to accept uh, the beating that could come out of it right and i did get some beating but i also felt i lived up to my responsibility and i also felt that that it was kind of part of my job to uh, to take decisions like that and and when you are uh, when when if you are in a sort of uh, kind of like borderline state of uh, crisis saturday evening and then there's one thing you you cannot you cannot be paralyzed by not taking decisions. Mm. Uh, I, I actually I use that uh, phrase uh, relatively o- often. You know, not taking a decision is actually also a decision, yep. uh, and uh, and that can uh, that can hit you as often uh, as uh, as a wrong decision. So so don't necessarily be afraid of taking decisions. And uh, as a leader, I think most leaders will have uh, either they don't know or maybe they are naive but most leaders are struggling with not taking decisions I think then you you we have all had leaders where we felt like eager for something to happen we say you know we don't care just say a or b and then then we at least know what way to go right so so that's probably something that is relatively rooted in me that I'm pretty afraid of not taking decisions so uh, so maybe some of them are taken on without too much analysis. Maybe it's just uh, because I lean very much on, on my principles or, or what I know has worked well before mm-hmm. or something like that. I think yeah. that's a great piece of advice, Chris, about the, the speed of decisions also, right? And the impact it has. Um, I, I heard this quote from uh, Jim Snape, who's the, the chairman of the board of, of Mask and Siemens. Mm-hmm. Uh, he said, mm-hmm. leadership is not about the power you hold, but the impact you create. Mm-hmm. So, so looking back at your, uh, okay, I like you're not that old, <laughs> mm-hmm. but if you look back at what you've done, uh, are you, is there any anything you're particularly proud of? The impact you created, whether it was the delivery or solving someone or making a difference to someone, anything particular that you're proud of? Yeah, when uh, yeah, honestly, I feel uh, when when I look back, uh, I think. I don't have like a handful of things or, or you know, go lives or big projects or, or something where I say, you know, this is what I'm proud about. But, but if, I, if I go through my gallery of, of people that I've worked with, then I have, uh, then I have uh, hundreds of things that I'm proud of, something where I, I hope that I've been part of uh, or, or, or maybe impacted some people. Uh, I'm uh, I'm I'm really really happy. From time to time, I receive you know emails from old colleagues or or people where I've been lucky to get the chance to mentor them or you know stuff like that where I get some some kind of feedback that they have been able to overcome a certain challenge or they got on with their things or they have taken some some decisions based on uh, you know maybe a dialogue with me or something. That that actually that I actually think are some of the things that I would be most proud about when when i feel that that there's been some kind of personal connect and people have gotten something out of me of course i'm proud when you uh, when you deliver a strategy and receive praise from from uh, whatever the the ceo or whatever but the, but but that for me is not necessarily that's not something that is personal for me that that was a, there's always been a team behind that right so uh, so that goes to the team where i feel it's more it's more personal if if I uh, help out someone who's been struggling or uh, you know do something for someone. Yeah, I can, I, I can certainly. Sorry, good. Oh, I, I can I can recall. You know, we we are we are human beings, right? And that means that we are not only the person that you see at work. We also have, you know we also a private person. And I actually like when when people uh, sort of. Get under my skin, and I get under their skin. When when there's a different kind of connect, that uh, that that allows uh, them to make a bigger impact on me, and it also allows me to make a, a bigger impact on, on people. And you know, you can you can rest assured that if you have a big group of people to manage, then 
treating everyone exactly the same, uh, you know, just textbook like, uh, and and don't bring in your 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 personal or your yourself. That that will definitely not work. You uh, you have to invest in those relationships to, in order for people to to open up. And and if people feel uh, that trust with you, then uh, then 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 they're just thriving a lot better. And then you you feel better. You you have a different kind of loyalty to your to your team, to, to your department, to, to Novo Nordisk, et cetera. So for me, it's around that personal leadership. And uh, I think if I look through my gallery, I, I hope I have uh, more than 100 things to be proud of. <laughs> yeah, I can certainly watch for that. Uh, and I'm not saying this just because you're on this podcast with me, but I think the, the ability to you know forge those personal relationships with, with the people you work with, I think that's, that's truly one of your, your strengths and something I learned immensely from. Thank Last you. Two Thank you. Think, uh, maybe just uh, one sentence on sure. that. I, I think I was not long ago. I, I had like a, a another talk on, on leadership, and uh, and that was actually went for hiring a person who, who who was going into leadership. And then I actually said to be a really good leader, I actually think you need to have a genuine interest in other people. I, it doesn't matter whether you are introvert or extrovert or or uh, you know call it uh, blue or red or green in what uh, in, in whatever personal profile and stuff but you have to have a genuine interest in uh, in other people if if you don't have that then then i don't think you can apply yourself good enough to uh, to become a, a good leader people need more than uh, than than you could say just a well educated person that can uh, that can uh, help you with expenses and do planning right <laughs> it's all about people at the end of the day it is Last two questions. Um, any podcasts or books that that you would recommend on any topic, not leadership, on anything that you found interesting? Or, or yeah, well, I didn't think uh, of that before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, personally, I uh, I do spend uh, quite some time commuting from my house to uh, to office, so I uh, I hear a lot of different podcasts, everything from uh, you know business stuff to. Uh, to, uh, to novels or whatever so uh, I'm a little bit all over the place I like that actually I uh, you know I would not be able to uh, to concentrate on uh, on hardcore business topics or uh, digitalization or technologies or whatever all the time so I like to relax and listen to other stuff uh, uh, one thing that I keep getting back to that is around uh, when, when talking leadership that's about authenticity and that comes in, you know, you, there are probably hundreds of books uh, written about uh, about that. But I really like to to read books where uh, where you sort of are introduced to people from various uh, from various jobs. That could be uh, uh, everything from an author to uh, to uh, to a colonel in the army or, uh, or or you know business people like we know them. But I really like to hear people's stories and you know tell around their personal leadership styles and. Uh, the common denominators for 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 what I admire as good leadership that is always when when people add that very personal things to it that that kind of personal authenticity that's a, that that is a topic that I'm super curious about and I actually think that's why some people can get uh, can get away with being really good leaders without necessarily being the 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 highest educated or you know because they are really true to themselves and people, you know, what you see is what you get. Uh, so so uh, I, I can also recognize that in, uh, in some of our bosses and executives, uh, the people that I admire the most, that is people that, that really share their personal, uh, how do you say, their, their, their personal uh, sides as well. Mm. They're true to who they are and don't try to, uh, to play someone else. Personal authenticity. That's something I'll take away from, from yeah. this. Yeah. Final yeah. question. Uh, you've touched upon, you know, fantastic uh, topics, which is, you know, authenticity, uh, decision making, uh, relationships with people, and so on. So, if if someone starting out on their first managerial position uh, asks for advice, mm. what would you give? What would you tell them, based on your own experience? Yeah, yeah, I've probably done that mistake myself. So this is like <laughs> from personal experiences. I mean, when when you hear about people getting into a new role, they start uh, they start uh, in a way making themselves bigger by by or better by pointing to all the things that should have been done differently. Mm -hmm. And then they say, you know, give me hundred days, then I'll uh, then I'll revolutionize this uh, place or department or whatever. 
I have uh, I have zero respect for that because that that in a way tells you that that's a tool that you pull out of your toolbox uh, if if you are in my opinion uh, maybe uh, anxious or not knowing what you want to do or so I think the, back to the theme around personal authenticity I think the most important thing is to spend time understanding listening uh, you know trying to to get under the skin of the of the organization and don't try to be sort of the wise guy uh, if, if if you join a department they have probably uh, let's say an average department they have been doing really good for many years i mean you are not requested in most cases to go and revolutionize that in three months right first thing is to understand what they do create some kind uh, create a good level of trust with the employees and then of course there can be tough calls to be made or things that you need to change or uh, or split departments or even lay off people or optimize or whatever. I have a lot of respect for that. So but I think my, my first uh, or my, my advice will be, you know, to people that, that, are, that are going into leadership. I mean, take it easy, <laughs> try, to, uh, try to understand people, uh, create trust. Once you have created the trust, you will get so much more. If, uh, if you from day one try to be uh, smarter than the people that have been there for many years, uh, then, uh, then I think you will fail. So uh, listen, understand, show, uh, be curious and, uh, and, and, and show some, uh, some of your vulnerability as well. I mean, don't try to be Superman if you are, there's only one Superman, right? <laughs> so um, yeah, that would, that would be my advice. On that note, um, I want to thank you, Chris, for this opportunity. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ranjit. Time flies, but uh, it was nice and uh, nice to nice to get a, a talk around this in, in our busy life. So uh, thank you for inviting me and uh, thank you.